Welcome to the Upkit Night Inn. So we're talking about bikepacking, freedom, journeys by bike. So Emma, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, thank you, I'll pass over to you. Thanks very much, Rob. And um, yeah, thanks to Outkit for, for hosting the webinar this evening. Um, just thought as a bit of an intro, I'd like um, set the scene about what bike packing is. So um, it's become trendy in the last few years and um, I tried to look up the official definition and I think some people define it as minimalist camping combined with mountain biking. But I think personally for the purposes of this evening, I'd be really happy if we could kind of open it up to all genres of traveling by bike because I think that makes it more open and more welcoming and I would like to categorically state that there is absolutely no need for a minimum number of tattoos or any kind of hipster moustaches. Everyone is welcome here. Um, and I am very uncool. And if I can bike pack, then, you know, it's definitely not a, a sport requiring of a certain uniform. And um, like many sports that uh, are becoming trendy, I think there's a danger of people feeling like they, they can't join in because they don't have the right kit. But I think the great thing about traveling by bike is that um, it's really possible with quite minimal kit like well you do need a bike obviously uh, that's very helpful um uh but essentially bike packing has been going on for ever since the bike has existed because people have been going touring which for some reason is mysteriously very uncool whereas bike packing is somehow cool but i personally think touring is also a kind of bike packing so um feel free to comment on that if you disagree but um like see every every kind of cyclist is welcome here this evening um my first real experience of bike packing was um, actually in Taiwan on a road bike, um, which I did take off road because some of the roads didn't exist anymore. And um, I, I went out there for a race and um, and I uh, thought I'd just hang around with a few people I met at the race. And um, we went, went bike packing for 10 days and um, I discovered lots of things about kit, like how annoying it is when your saddlebag sways the whole time and how non-ideal it is when the saddlebag decides to rest on your back wheel um all things i learned <laughs> also that road shoes are really impractical for bike packing if you want to walk through muddy landslides um but anyway after that i was hooked and i just loved it i love the feeling of freedom of traveling of being self-sufficient um apart from the need to restock on snacks the whole time so that was my introduction to bike packing and i absolutely love it it's become for me a wonderful way to escape especially i think this year when um Lots of other forms of travel have been really quite restricted. And let's face it, traveling by bike is really, really safe in terms of not getting too close to other people and risking catching virus or passing on virus. So for me, it's been um, a real, a real, um, a real boon this year to be able to get away with, with friends or alone and um, travel by bike close to home. You don't have to go very far for it to feel a long way sometimes. Um, so that's my little introduction to bike packing. Um, I would now like to introduce a poll. I think we have the first poll, which Alice is going to put up for us. So this is a poll where you get to vote on screen. And I'll count you down. So you have time pressure now. Are you ready? So I'm going to count you down. 10, 9, 8. We'll see how well I can count. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. It's over. Can you tell us the results? <laughs> cool. So let's see who we've got here this evening. We've um, got a, basically half of you watching a, would count yourself as newbies, which is excellent. Um, so if you have questions about bike packing, um, definitely sling them in the chat and, um, and we'll discuss them later because um, Catherine especially is hugely expert in all these things. Catherine is actually the person who got me into bike, like proper bike packing as in sleeping outdoors in the wild and um so she knows lots of stuff and she's great at explaining things um overnighter light and fast um disappointing number of people want to have a party with their friends <laughs> is that because you're scared of virus <laughs> it's always a party with friends um mug dangler yep that's a that's a very um if, if anyone doesn't know what a mug dangler is it's quite a controversial issue about whether you pack your mug which obviously you have to have a mug, otherwise how would you drink your cup of tea in the morning? Whether you dangle it off the saddlebag or whether you pack it inside the saddlebag. And I've met really very friendly, welcoming people who went absolutely rabid at the thought of dangling a mug off the saddlebag. I was very surprised. So it wakes strong emotions in many people. Me, I don't really care. I just want a cup of tea in the morning. Um, lone wolf, not too many of those. Um, party with friends, also not too many. Credit card tourer. Yep, almost the smallest category. 
slow and heavy, light and fast. I like the fact that that means that 80% of you haven't defined whether you're slow or fast or light or heavy. I think it depends how much kit one is carrying, doesn't it? So excellent. Thanks for that. And we'll, um, we'll try and accommodate your, um, your self-identification in our discussion. Um, so now I move on to chatting to Catherine, Catherine Moore. Um, now, Catherine, you're actually the person who really got me into, like I said, real bikepacking in that um, the first time I bivvied out since I was a teenager was when I was working with Catherine at GCN and, um, and she persuaded me to join School Night Bivvy Club and uh, I turned up and there's no way I would have slept outside in the woods in a bivvy bag on my own. And um, she basically got me back into it and uh, also encouraged me to try my first gravel race in the Pyrenees uh, last, uh, last summer. And so I owe Catherine a lot because uh, it's really got me into a sport that I love. Um, so, but Catherine, I know you didn't grow up really immersed in cycling. So could you tell us a little bit more about how you got into cycling and especially bikepacking? Yeah, for sure. So um, if, I, if I imagine now when I was a kid that I'd be such an avid cyclist, I would laugh because I was the least sportiest kid at school. I absolutely hate, well, I didn't hate sports, but I was particularly bad at them. Um, and it was after uni, I thought, you know, getting into my adult life and I should probably do something about the lack of exercise in my life. It wasn't very healthy to do nothing. Um, and I was really into arts and science and other stuff, but I thought I should try something. And I had a little sturdy hybrid that I used to poop around on and tried a road bike once. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So I got really into road cycling uh, and that was maybe three or four years of that before I accidentally discovered gravel riding. Um, I had a last minute opportunity to join a brand on a trip up to the Cairngorms where we spent uh, two nights in Bothies and YHAs um, or the Scottish equivalent, um, really thrown at the deep end with gravel and off-roading. Um, in fact, it was terrifying because my first ever road crash was on gravel. <laughs> and um, it sort of went from there. I, I think I actually started bike packing on the road so I would have put myself in the credit card tourer category um, because I eased myself in by doing multi-day trips but staying in airbnbs um, each night which I think is a really good way if you're just starting out because you get the uh, multi-day element but without perhaps having to carry so much or think about where you're going to sleep um, and it all kind of snowballed <laughs> so yeah were there actual snowballs involved because that is a cold way to bike pack no, no. I think the coldest I've got is about minus two. And I don't really want to go beyond that. <laughs> no, that's true. You would definitely need a campfire for that. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I agree about the credit card tour and, and like the um, staying in, in budget or easy accommodation as a, as a first step. But a lot of people do find that step towards being sort of more self-sufficient, even if not totally self-sufficient in terms of camping, tent, bivouac. Um, a bit daunting. So what would you recommend as a way of making that step from hotel to mm. camping? Great question. Um, I've been really, really lucky to have some really amazing friends that have done this for years and years. So they're great to go with because they'll offer you all sorts of practical advice. Uh, one of my friends is like ex army knows every single bushcraft skill in the book, which is pretty handy. Um, I guess it's whatever you feel comfortable with. I started out with a bivvy bag because it was a relatively cheap option. Um, I actually got a second hand out kit one <laughs> off eBay. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, if you've grown up using a tent, why not try a tent? Um, if you are a bit alternative like me, I really enjoy hammocking, but I only got to try that because my friends had one. Um, so yeah. I'm skeptical. I mean, I think I would fall out of a hammock. How do you not fall out of the hammock if you're it's, a ro if you're a rolly type sleeper? I roll around so much, and you can sleep on your side or on your back. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind you wake of up all like not, rolled up. It, it it's not like a big flat one like you see in like something from the tropics, you know, with all the rope and everything. They actually come up all the way around you, so it's actually almost almost impossible to fall out. Um, from my experience I've never fallen out yeah um, the one thing that I did have once was I had something quite sharp <laughs> this is a bad story I had something quite sharp or pokey in my back pocket 
there'd been a storm in the night and had got very wet and my boyfriend had asked me to jump into his hammock with him because he was cold and as I got out of the hammock bearing in mind it has two people in it which is not recommended in the morning whatever it was was in my back pocket must have just caught the fabric and it shattered straight down the middle um, so yeah the the manufacturer's instructions are usually there for a reason <laughs> No sharp object in the hammock. Yeah, that makes sense. I've also found that, yeah, sharp objects or needles in um, inflatable camping mats, non-ideal. Yeah, I was once camping and just uh, absentmindedly repairing something and absentmindedly just oh, no. stuck the needle in my um, in my then therm rest and it doesn't work as well after you've done that in the strings. So it turns out. Anyway, thanks for that, Catherine. So you recommend basically starting out with friends if possible for a bit of moral support and, and um, well, camping support as well yeah yeah absolutely um, I have a, a bad confession to make actually oh well it's not necessarily bad but I've never actually camped on my own yet it's something that I'd like to do one day but I'm just plucking up the courage so I don't so I don't think like you can do whatever you want you can be a seasoned bike packer and always go out with friends like it yeah. doesn't define you or you're no less worthy of doing something just because you don't do it on your own totally agree I totally agree and I found the when I first bivied on my own bikepacking, I was a bit scared. And the best thing was to just be so exhausted that I couldn't stay awake to be scared. So I just fell asleep. <laughs> that helped. Um, one of the things that I was going to ask you, because I, 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 one of the things I really like about the way you write is that you're really welcoming. And, and you, I think you, you make cycling and bikepacking really accessible to people of all levels in cycling and all walks of life. And I think we've seen this year, the huge growth in cycling, certainly in the UK. And I know lots of other countries, it's, it's, it's um, you know it's been one of the few positives because of the the covid thing is that a lot of people have taken up cycling as a way of having a local holiday and you know getting away and traveling and so we've seen way more people from different backgrounds in the sport but it is let's face it it is still in the uk quite a white sport and quite a middle class sport and there are definitely still more guys than girls that do it it's changing and it you know it's nothing against the people that do it already but i'd love i'd love it if our sport that I know we both love if it could be even more inclusive and I know you've written about this how do you think we can help because it's like it would be nice to be proactive rather than just saying yeah anyone's welcome what do you think we can do yeah it's a really good question I think um if you're looking at it from a bike packing standpoint you have to step back I think to why people cycle or why they don't cycle in the first place um so the more that we can do to encourage people to cycle as part of their everyday routines, whether it's just to the shops or as a leisure activity, then I think it'll be a natural progression from there. Um, I think if we try and go straight in at like the bike packing end, then um, that's kind of tricky because there's so many different things involved. I would never have dreamt of starting with bike packing or touring because you've got to think about the bike and you've got to think about all your equipment and where you're going to go. And there's so many things, whereas I think, maybe getting into road cycling or mountain biking to start with and then building on that is a bit easier. Um, having said that, I think representation is something that's really important. I think people of all different backgrounds, race, uh, of different ages, abilities, etc., all these different factors need to see themselves represented. They need role models and people to look up to in the industry, it's uh, social identity theory, they call it. And they say, if you see somebody that looks like you or has characteristics like you doing something, then you're more likely to do it. And that's like, I, that's certainly something that I've seen. I, if, the more I see women in cycling, the more inspired that I am to do more of what they're doing. Um, so I think that that's something that we can work on. But I think most of it is just going back to grassroots. Yeah, yeah, yeah good point and and the more people that cycle as part of their daily life then, then the next step to maybe a two-day trip with a as a credit card tour and then a then branching out into camping is, is is gets a bit easier but doing everything all at once is a, is a big call i agree yeah cool thank you very much for that um yeah i think a lot of brands are doing are doing really good stuff in being more representative um uh in their in their advertising which is excellent to see um so now I wanted to ask you about some of your side projects because I know that you are incredibly creative and um, if anyone follows Catherine on Instagram, they'll um, see like it's, it's insane. But I have a bit of a bone to pick with you because <laughs> I asked you to make me a special saddlebag and I'm, I'm still hoping that you'll have time and uh, a very specific design. But I wanted it in navy blue and you refused to make it in navy blue, and uh, which is my favourite colour. And I, 
I'm still a bit miffed as to why you wouldn't do navy blue for me. Can you explain what your theory of colour is and why you have a thing against navy blue? I don't really have a theory of colour. I just like bright colours and they're the only ones that I've got stock of for my uh, my bikepacking bags, which is quite rich now that I'm sat here wearing black, I guess. <laughs> it's a good top though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. So if I get you enough navy blue fabric, you'll make me a bike bag. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll have a ton left over and you'll have to do others. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um okay now we're down down to the quick fire questions so what is your favorite bike packing trip so far ever oh, really hard to say just one two that stand out for me two years ago i did um a race you would call it um more of a rally event type thing called the catalonia trail uh so that was from girona in um in catalonia in spain oh well contentious Catalonia, um, so Catalonia. in the Pyrenees um, and another one was the second city divide uh, which is an incredible bikepacking route uh, that Steve can also talk about um, which goes between Manchester and Glasgow in the UK and um, yeah that was phenomenal but I think the six days of sunshine might have had something to do with that one too. <laughs> That's quite rare on that route I would have thought. So lucky. <laughs> Once every 10 years, sorry I shouldn't yeah. say that. Who knows with the climate change? It might be every year now. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, next question. Um, what's the worst thing that's ever gone wrong for you uh, on a bike trip or an expedition? Um, so one of the first trips I did was actually on my own, but it was a credit card touring uh, tour um, to see the Tour de France when it was in Normandy. So I guess it was 2017 or 16. And um, so I did like the bottom part of the Southwest and then the northern part of France. But I got a little bit too merry in Cherbourg after stage two. <laughs> and I lost my phone and my debit card. So I had 200 euros on me, thankfully, in cash. And then I had to skip between Airbnbs, asking them if they could use, if I could use their computer each night to book the next one. And uh, I bought myself a little GoPro type thing, a really cheap one. Uh, just so I can still take photos but otherwise it was wonderful because I didn't get distracted by stuff on my phone and I actually yeah. enjoyed the tour a lot more like even if I was on a strict food budget too. <laughs> Enforced digital detox awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was great. <laughs> Did you ever get the phone back? No. Oh wow no. awesome. Totally my fault. <laughs> That's a good story. Um, okay next question what's the one random or weird thing you would take on a bikepacking trip? So this is a really strange one. So when we did the Catalonia Trail, there was a wonderful man at the start called Jean May who'd uh, put on the whole thing. He ended up riding the last stage with us as well, which was really fun. But as part of the event, he'd got us all a present, which was very funny because we come to sign on and there were maybe 20, 30 people there. And when you get into like the racing side of things, or maybe even just, you know, we're going up into the mountains and everyone wants to be as lightweight as possible and have minimal gear, but also enough gear to be able to cope with every weather condition, etc. <laughs> we all already realised we had a lot more stuff than everyone else because we were going to be camping, but we didn't realise that most of the people were using the mountain refuges. And then Jaume gave us all this like test tube vial of this pink salt. And he was like, oh, it's a local delicacy, this fabulous rosemary salt or whatever it was from the Catalan Pyrenees. You must take it with you. It's a present for your cooking for when you get home. And we were all just like... But when you're actually bikepacking, everyone that's so, knows... That's you, so you don't, sweet, but yeah. I don't want any extra stuff to carry. <laughs> no, and everyone knows that when you're bikepacking, you don't need to carry salt because you can just lick it off your arm at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so it's very sweet, but a bit strange. Yeah. Do you take it on every trip now? No. No, no I think yeah. we used it when we got home and it tasted just like normal salt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's cool but then that ties in nicely with my next question which is what is your favorite campfire meal and does it involve pink salt oh, no. and can you give us the recipe if it's okay this is this is embarrassing because it's really bad but um there's no such thing as bad there's I no judgment like here every single time a packet of super noodles delicious Doesn't matter what it is add the spices if you like a tin of mackerel in tomato sauce or wow. you go for the spicy version oh my goodness and a couple of dried mushrooms just That's in oat like cuisine. A pot. So you cook, you just boil the water because I don't like putting food in my um, in my burner if I can it's, help it. It's, it's especially mackerel. Water, exactly. <laughs> Put water in there and the 
mushrooms because they take a little while to soften up and then just pour it into the noodles and add the mackerel um wow that's not that's gourmet because, well it's good because it's all stuff that you can keep for multiple yeah. days without putting yeah. in the fridge and then of course if you're passing a really sweet little cottage that's selling honey or a bakery or whatever that's the great thing about touring is yeah. that you get to try all the local delicacies but that's my go-to crap awesome. meal <laughs> thank you <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to try the mackerel. I don't think the, the stinky tin would put me off um, afterwards. Um, thank you very much. The last question I have is, um, what is the bike packing trip you dream of? Can you come bike packing with me? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Switzerland. And yeah, on, maybe. I might have just jinxed it. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully next year. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. And I uh, can't wait to go bike packing with you again. Uh, yes, please. Um, and I'll show you, you must mine. remember your sleeping bag this time because oh I've got a really warm you know when one people, you know when people say you make me feel cold because you're not wearing enough so the first night that Emma and I went bikepacking this was in the summer but she was just in a bivy bag was and, I yes don't you remember <gasps> I remember being freaking cold but I, I know you're hard it. but that's something else <laughs> no, I, there's a word for it in Swiss German which is gefrörli which is for someone who gets cold really easily and I am one like basically a wimp and I do remember that I did not sleep all night and then I had to get up and dash to the train the next morning because we were filming the next day and I looked haggard because I had not had any sleep and I was so miserable but it was so worth it, it was so really good <laughs> yeah in a good way um yeah I've toughened up I can sleep even when I'm cold now and I've got a really really warm alp kit sleeping bag now so um no worries now <laughs> yeah uh, and you need it here in the spring and winter because it's full of snow um, thank you, Catherine. I'm going to move on to Steve now, so you can go and make a cup of tea if you like. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, but we're going to talk to you later in, in the Q&A. Uh, Steve, we haven't met in person, I don't think, but um, I know all about you, obviously. So most people um, know of you as one of the Team GB professional cycling hero, double gold medalist at the Rio Games, and you've been twice world champion in two different disciplines, both on the track and on the road in the time trial. Um, but actually, is, is almost incredible. Cycling isn't even really your first proper sport, and you took it up relatively late. Um, I say that as someone who started cycling seriously at 22. But you started in, in your know, 30s, 35, 36, I think. Um, could you tell us a bit about what you did in sport before you joined British Cycling as part of the development programme? Yeah, of course. Um... Thanks, uh, thanks very much everyone for joining us and uh, it's lo lovely to be here. So um, yeah, I guess I am a really unconventional athlete. <laughs> um, not many people turn elite pro at 36, I think I was, which um, was a bit of a mad dream really, but that all really came about through losing my eyesight. Um, so uh, before I was a, I was, I was a cyclist, uh, I was training to be an, uh, well, wanted to be an alpine guide. That was really kind of my dream. Um, and I was kind of working through the processes of that. I just finished uh, my MIA in, in summer kind of climbing guiding and was looking to doing the MIC. I think those things have changed now. I don't really keep in touch with that anymore, but uh, I think they're called different things now. Um, yeah, and it was just basically a, a kind of um, routine eye check that I, I said, listen, I can't really see that well in the dark. And if I drop my keys on the floor, I can't, I can't see them. You know, it takes me ages to, to see them. So that came back with a diagnosis of this degenerative eye condition, which was a bit of a, a, bit of a massive shock. And, and it kind of changed my path dramatically, really. Um, after about two or three months, maybe six months being pretty, pretty down that I wasn't going to be a guide. Um, but I guess, you know, looking back now, I think that's kind of funny because I still wanted to press on with that, but who on earth would go into the mountains with a blind dude? You know, it's just not, it's not really relative that is it? So, uh, so yeah. And, and a friend of mine, Karen Dark, who um, also races uh, for Team GB in a wheelchair, amazing, amazing woman. Um, who's always been hugely inspiring to me when I spoke to her and said, oh, listen, you know, kind of, you know, really pathetically in a way, like, oh, my life's over. The adventures are, are, are done with. Um, she sort of said, you know, like, shut up, you idiot, you know, crack on, you know, come and ride on the back of a tandem and train with me in Mallorca. <laughs> like, no, you don't understand, Karen, you don't understand. Talk to a woman who's in a wheelchair, of all things. It's, so, yeah, it's really stupid. Um, 
but I, I kind of wasn't quite done with climbing. So um, I, I, I guess I set my sights on, on El Capitan and I, I wanted to go and um, kind of give myself a big challenge. So I, I guess in a way, just prove to myself that even though I had this kind of diagnosis and all of a sudden you've got this disability that, uh, you know, you can still do stuff, you can still achieve things. Uh, so I spent a year training um, and then went in solo, rope solo to El Capitan. Um, oh. which was uh, an absolutely that, that was life changing in itself um, wow. you know like I was, I was I'd phone my wife the day before I started the climb and said that I'm too scared you know I was in tears I had sponsors and things and it had all gone wrong and I was trying to raise loads of money and it was all terrible and, and I just remember waking up that that kind of morning just thinking I, I have to try this I've, I've spent a year of my life training for this I've got to try and even if I don't even if I can't do it at least I've tried you know um and walking up to the base of the climb that morning, I climbed a route called Zodiac, which isn't, you know, everyone goes to El Cap to climb the nose, but uh, do, doing loads of research, I, I chose to climb a harder route, not because I'm a better climber, but generally because the hauling's easier, because it's all overhanging, pretty much. Your haul bag hangs out in the breeze, so it's really easy to haul on your own. Um, obviously when there's two or three of you, it can, you know, someone can kind of travel up with the haul bag, freeing it as it gets jammed. But when you're on your own, that becomes a logistical nightmare, which is, I think why most people fail soloing El Cap. Um, it's the logistics of the hauling, you know, most people who climb it, uh, you know, way better climbers than I am. Um, it's solo. incredible to me. I've, I've taken up bouldering and I can, I ba basically, I can do on an overhang, I can do about three holds before I fall off in exhaustion. And the idea of choosing a route up El Capitan that's all overhanging is, it's like you're, it's like you're a different life form. Like that's incredible. Uh, no, you hang off gear. It's cheating, really. It's like, <laughs> it's like it doesn't really count. Well, I think it's pretty amazing. That's absolutely <laughs> incredible. Um, uh, so yeah, so just so, walking up to the base of that, I was so scared. I, I like, I remember thinking like, I need to find a way I can not do this with a good enough excuse. So <laughs> you know, I even, I even thought about break. You know, like generally, I thought about breaking my own ankle at one point. You know, I had sixty kilos of a haul bag on my bag with water and food and all the gear. And I thought, you know, if I just step on the side of my ankle, I'll just break my ankle, and that'll be that's le that's legit. Then isn't it? You can't climb out with a broken ankle. But I was even too scared to do that, so I just had to. <laughs> But I, rem I remember getting to the top and just thinking, like, it took me six days on my own in like a vertical rock desert. Amazing, amazing experience. And I remember sitting at the top and I just thought, you know, just like anything's possible. Absolutely yeah. anything is possible. You know, if you commit 100% to doing something and put all your energy and emotion into it, you can achieve it. And so I went back to Karen, that seed Karen plant about, you know, riding on the back of a bike and racing. And at that point, it was like, I think about three years to the, uh, to the Rio games. And, and at that point, I was just like, right, let's set an impossible target that is, you know, just not achievable. And let's just work and see if we can do that. And yeah, and, and you know, three years later here, there I was on the, on the start line of a, of a Paralympic final in the pursuit, which was, um, yeah, just kind of surreal, really. That's pretty incredible. And so, so you went to cycling with the like fixed intention of trying to make the Paralympic team for GB. Like yeah. you knew that was your goal straight away. To be That's honest, it was, it was to become a Paralympian. That yeah. you know the medals. You know that was just like that was proper dreaming. That that was not going to happen. So just to become a Paralympian yeah. was that yeah. was the target. Um, my, you know, my wife Caroline and I. That was it. We thought you know for we moved from Scotland down to, you know, just outside Manchester and, and, yeah. and bridge to, to just put everything into this. And, you know, I mean, there's certainly a big chunk of that medals hers as well. Cause you know, she supported me through that, through that journey. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was just to become a Paralympian. But I remember as soon as I got the phone call for selection, which I'm sure, you know, all too well as quite a stressful phone call where you just think, where am I going? Am I not going? You know, have these two and a half years been like full gas for nothing? Um, you know, and then you get you get that phone call to say, yep, yeah, you've been selected and you're going. And and straight away, within seconds, I was like, I have to win a medal. I have I'm going, I have to win a medal. And and the next six months that led into that were just, you know, were just brutal, which um which which you know all about, mate. So I know about the brutal, but I'd never had any hope of winning a medal. So I was just a for me, it was a bit, <laughs> bit of a fluke, I guess. Um that's funny. So I guess, uh, this is not a question I had prepared, but it, it your description of the El Capitan, like before, it sounds like you enjoyed the climb, but the, the time before was the stressful bit. And I have the same memories from bike racing that 
once the race started, I loved it mostly, apart from when I crashed, which is quite a lot, but mostly I loved it. What I hated was the start line. And nowadays when, um, you know, like there's always something in life that's a bit of a challenge, but however shit a day I've had, um, even the really, like a really crappy day, I think nothing can ever be as bad as being on the start ramp for an Olympic time trial with millions, literally millions of people watching and not wanting to be there, which was only the case once in my life, but uh, out of the three times I did it, but it was awful. It, you know, I knew that um, that I was injured, that I that it was raining, that I was probably gonna crash. And I, and I, every now in my life, anything, nothing is ever gonna be as bad as that, that feeling of, of being in the public eye and being miserable about it, which, is, which was worse. That, that not, I'm not saying the overall experience, which was very positive, but which was worse, the, the stress before an Olympic final or walking to the bottom of El Capitan? Oh, the, the bottom of El Cap by far. You know, that, that made rocking up to that, that you know, pursuit final, having, having set, you know, like having set the world record five hours earlier. So, you, you know, you, you, you know you're the fastest yeah. bike there. All you've got to do is yeah. deliver that same performance. Okay. You had the advantage of being a lot better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think if I hadn't have gone through that process of walking up to the base of El Cap to start climbing that, that thing, you know, like I don't, I don't think I would have ever ended up in Rio. You yeah. know, that I mean, yeah. I really think the two of them are that, you know, like without the without the El Cap thing, I would never have found the strength or adversity or what it, you know, whatever it is, you know, knowing my character. Because I, I, you know, like literally, I remember rocking up to that final and being not phased at all, you know, like just there thinking, and the reality was, was it was just like, well, what's going to happen if, I, if, if we crash, I'm not going to die. Yeah. You know, whereas on El Cap, then you really can die. Yeah. I was probably going to die. You yeah. know, if I made a mistake so long El Cap, I was going to die. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that for, for, the, for probably the, the three or four years after El Cap, that's what I, that's just, that was my reason. Yeah, re, I reason with everything, everything that was scary, worrying was like, you know, well, I'm not going to die, but that's faded as time has gone on. Now, when I get to the start line of world championships and things like that, you kind of, you know, there's, when I say, oh, it's, you know, I'm not going to die. It's kind of like that, you know, like in my own head, it's like, yeah, you've, 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 you've burned that one, mate. You can't keep yeah. it for the rest the of your effectiveness life. runs out. Do you ever find, um, so you've come from a, like a really proper mountaineering background and you've ended up which is also an elite sport, but you've ended up in an elite sport that is very different, you know, especially training for the track. It's, it's very regimented. And, you know, I never, I never raced the track, but I know what the regime is like in Manchester. It's very strict and it's a little dry compared to, you know, the wild adventures you were on before in the Alps. And um, do you ever find it a little frustrating or do you ever feel like you're kind of like, there's a little wild Steve that's caged? How, how, how do you cope or, or is it fine? Or are you just happy to not be out in the snow? with cold fingers no 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 not at all um no it's 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 um it's it's a real challenge like to try and balance that uh you know as an example was the last week we had amazing snow here the best snow we've had in yorkshire and i had i was meant to do two hours on the road and a turbo session with intervals and i thought i dug out my fat bike and i thought i'll go and do two hours on my fat bike that'll be cool and then while i was prepping that i was just like who are you kidding me? I ended up doing five hours, like a solo epic on my fat bike and, and just messaged my coach and said, man, I'll do the intervals tomorrow. You know, I'm just not, I can't, you know, like I, when I started cycling, I had to stop climbing because climbing yeah. was a massive passion of mine, bouldering everything, had to draw a line under it, yeah. couldn't do it because on those sunny days where you've got those hard interval sessions to do, which I really don't want to do, I knew I would have been sacked it off, grabbed the climbing shoes and gone bouldering because it's so was that because because of the time and the energy that you'd expend in climbing or was it because of the shoulder muscle and the weight um pr probably just yeah just just the distraction yeah. you know from from what i should be doing you know i mean it's <laughs> it's it sounds cliche but you know to to be the best in the world at something you've got to give everything yeah, and yeah. absolutely everything and yeah and I think I, a lot of people don't realize it's 24 7 yeah you know, it's constant everything yeah. you do everything you eat drink recovery yeah, yeah. You know, and it's funny because this the right. sacrifices aren't what people often think like it's not i mean i don't know about you but for me i didn't, I didn't wasn't a big party person anyway what i was upset at was i had to sacrifice running like i couldn't run in the race season because it was 
detrimental to cycling. And that was hot. Like, it was the first thing I used to go for a run the morning after Worlds every year, um, just because I was so desperate to get out running again. So I know how you feel about that. So yeah, so so I've I've noticed I've seen that in in your kind of off season from track racing, you you do some cool gravel races and bike packing adventures. Is that your way of kind of escaping from the regime? And yeah, I mean it is good base training to ride a bike. Um, but on the other hand, um, you do stuff partially sighted that I struggle with, even with my contact lenses in and, and nice clean glasses. Um, how, how the hell do you ride off road and do like crazy steep hiker bike with partial vision? How have you learned to cope with that? <laughs> I trip and, over. And can I learn something? <laughs> I, I fall on my face a lot. That's that's certainly for sure. So do uh, I. <laughs> no, it's. Um... Yeah, like uh, what what I choose to ride is like really sensible um, in terms of like I manage, you know, like I manage my my abilities and sometimes, you know, it gets a little bit spicy and you've got to you've kind of got to rein yourself in because the one thing I can't afford to do is obviously get injured because if it's BC are pretty lenient on me, like my coach understands like he gets me, he knows that me riding the track or the road for a full season, not doing anything outside of stuff will just be like, Steve's not going to race well like that. So he knows that I have to go and do this stuff. Um, you know, like an example, that was uh, Rovamini, the fat bike race, which is when I first started um, uh, with, with Elk Kit because I, I wanted one of their fat bikes to go and win this race. And, uh, and that was three weeks before the Truck World Championships back in Rio in, I think, 2018. And my coach was, you know, I, I said in a year, a year advance, I'm going to go and do this race. So whatever the track worlds are, we have to work around that, whatever that is. And he was kind of like, OK, OK. And of course, as the months ticked down and I kept saying, I'm going to go and do this race. He kind of got the point of, oh, actually, OK, we need to we need to adjust this to, um, you know, to to allow Steve to, to do this, because, you know, if I don't allow him to do this race, He's going to turn up to the world pissed and you know he's not going to race well you have to be um, a little careful with our english audience because piss means drunk you think you mean pissed off in english yeah. turning yeah. up drunk would definitely get you kicked off the program off the squad for sure yeah only, uh, only one person got away with that yeah so um, you know it's um it's just balancing it isn't it but yeah i know i can't i can't afford to get injured because if i get injured doing the stuff that i'm passionate about even though it's riding it's the kind of riding that i I, you know, like it's not frowned upon, but you know, a lot of the guys at the Velodrome, you know, but who, you know, yeah. who were out and out road races and stuff, yeah. just like, why are you doing that? Mate? Yeah, you it's know, a very um, it's, with a fat bike, people are just like, what the hell is that thing? Yeah, it's funny because I think that, um, the especially road cycling and track cycling, it's 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 quite a sort of narrow field of vision, and it's important to be focused when you want to be the best in the world, like you said, but. <laughs> Um, when people only know, especially road racing, they, that's all there is. And um, it's hard for them to appreciate actually that doing other sports or other kinds of cycling can actually be a real, um, it can it can actually bring a richness. And, and I think um, having a bit of variety in your training, no matter what level you train at, whether you're, you know, once a week amateur or, or, um, or, or full on pro like you, like it, it actually helps you to remain mentally stimulated and enjoy it. And enjoying it is all the difference. And when people ask me, you know, how, how do you, oh, you know, my, my son or daughter wants to go pro, what, you know, I was like, well, don't worry about the pro thing, worry about enjoying it. And that's the most important thing. So I think, I think you're totally, I think you're totally right. You're um, with the variety and the fat biking and the five hours in the snow. I think it's great, but I'm going to have to move you along to the quick fire round now. You can't get out of it. Um, so Steve, what is the worst thing that's ever gone wrong for you, either on a biking trip or an expedition? You're not oh. dead. So it can't have been that bad. Yeah, that's uh I think biking wise, the the the, um, the latest thing that I think was was really gutting, and it, and it was actually anything to do with me. For for when I rode the second city divide, what Catherine was uh, talking about earlier. So my goal there was to ride that as fast as I possibly could, and I took one of my mates from the team who's not a bike packer, um, you know, not he's a good mountain biker, but he's not into the bike packing thing. And we got kind of into kill the forest, and his and his, his rear wheel exploded, so like four spokes in his back wheel disintegrated but that was kind of really the end of his journey and it was you just, left him for the midges <laughs> yeah yeah well it was october so there weren't any of them but oh. um it was kind of you know the first day he'd really struggled through we'd done a 20 hour day um we'd slept in a bus shelter which he wasn't best impressed with 
And then, you know, the second day he'd finally kind of got it, you know, he'd really understood what this was about and traveling and, you know, seeing things and just being really free. And then his bike kind of packed up and, and, and that was, so that was the end of his journey. And, he, you know, it, it was just like, I, I carried on on my own because, <laughs> because that's just like, that was what I was going to do. But, you know, I, I you know, he, he gave me his blessing in that respect, but yeah, I was, I was just kind of, you know, when you ride off into the night and this was supposed, it was always supposed to be a, a kind of mates going, doing something all of a sudden yeah. your mate's not there and you're riding off into the darkness and the pissing rain. It's just kind of a bit, it's kind of the bike packing equivalent of touching the void, right? <laughs> Not quite. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Next round. Uh, next quick fight. Um, what is the one random weird thing that you don't think other people take on bike packing trips that you would take? I would think there'd be very few people that have taken a wheelchair on a bike packing trip. <laughs> so after, right. the games, after um after the games in 2016. Uh, so myself, my wife, uh, my friend Jacko and Karen, who I mentioned, who got me into the sport, we went to Patagonia to ride the Carretera Austral, um, which wow. is phenomenal. Uh, oh. And of course, Karen's in a wheelchair riding a handbike. So, but during the evening and stuff, she, she has to get around. So I towed a bob trailer on the, on the, on the back of my bike with, <laughs> with Karen's wheelchair. Awesome. Uh, stacked on top of that so that's probably the weirdest thing i've ever taken by that is pack. amazing i love it do you have some, i hope you have some photos i want to see yeah, them there's a there's a film actually that i uh that i made about on on youtube so uh awesome. yeah it's pretty entertaining awesome thank you that was that was a beautiful story um last question a bit of a letdown after that one probably unless it's a really good one your answer um what is your favorite campfire meal and give us the recipe you don't eat do you i bet you're one of those is it just bars all the way and gelled Oh, no, for breakfast. No, not at all. No, no, okay. no I, I, I'll generally take one gel bike packing, and that's the bit of food that I know I'll never touch. The emergency unless, food, yeah. Unless it gets really bad. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a service station shocker. Like, yeah. just pull into service station, just eat sugar and water. Do you have a favorite thing that you like? Because I have, there's like, like three things from a, from a servo that I am like lusting after after a day of bike of hard riding uh you know, if, just anything if, if there's hot food i'm i'm always down with like a sausage roll or pie yeah. kiwi in it pie yeah stuff. yeah you are a bit kiwi yeah uh a can of coke never never go and chocolate milk i guess get the protein yeah. in. chocolate milk nice thank you very much that's not exactly a recipe but i'll forgive you uh, <laughs> um thank you very much steve um i've forgotten what's next in the running order and my screen has turned off but i'm sure alice can help me do we have another poll alice yes we do yeah. right we have another poll <laughs> uh and again the options will come up on the screen and you have 10 seconds to vote roughly judged by me counting so here we go so this is a bit more of a fun one um you're gonna have more than 10 seconds i'm gonna talk you through it so this is about if you've bike packed before, what you wish you'd known, basically. So what you wish your friends had told you before you set off on your first trip. And so you've got a few options that, you know, that just one night is enough and that you feel like a proper adventurer. Um, going to sleep on your own is a little bit scary. Um, how to pack your seat pack so it doesn't sway. And if anyone has the answer to that, please tell me because I still don't know it. Um, that you will waste a lot of time either taking photos of or staring at your bike if you take your phone with you. Um, and that, yeah, packing is important to separate sticky, sugary stuff from your electronics. Um, a handlebar bag makes a great pillow. I wish someone had told me that because I still didn't know it. Um, and always take more food than you need. So you would, if we could, uh, if you could vote on this, you can have several. I think you can vote for more than one, but I'm going to count you down now. So since you've had a bit of talking time, I've got to go five, four, three, two, one, and your time is up. Thanks, Alice. We're going to have results up now. So the winner is, yeah, which is nice to see that one night is already an adventure. And I totally agree. And I think um, Alistair, who was the last um, host of an Alpkit webinar, was a great um, promoter or um, advocate of micro adventures and staying close to home. And it's, um, it's something I've definitely discovered this year. You don't even need to catch a train to have an adventure. And one night is definitely enough to feel filthy and like you've had a proper adventure. Um, <laughs> so the 22% of people who would like to have known how to pack your seat bag so it doesn't sway. Do any of you, if any of you actually know, can we have a chat later in the Q&A? Because I, 
really cannot solve that one. The only way I've managed to find to stop the seat pack from swaying is if it's resting on the back wheel, which as discussed is definitely non-ideal, both for speed and for the saddlebag itself. Um, it just has a drainage hole afterwards. Um, yeah, so there we go. Uh, thank you very much. That's the second poll done and dusted. I think I hand over to Rob now, is that correct? It is correct. Thank you, Emma. Superb hosting. Thank you. And thank you, Steve. Thank you, Catherine. And so um, what we'll do now is we're going to have some, some questions and answers. And what we'll do for time, so we've got 10 minutes until we said we'd end. And I want to make sure that people who need to go at half eight can go at half eight. So what we'll do is have some questions. And at half eight, I'll give the results of the caption competition. And the results have been, the, the answers have been absolutely amazing and have kind of made it quite hard for me to concentrate on everything else that's going on. So thank you for those. And then what we'll do after the caption competition is actually we will stay on for a bit because there's loads of questions coming through. Uh, so if you want to stick around, feel free to, to stay with us for a bit. So stacks and stacks of questions. Thank you very much for all those. There have been loads of questions about kit. What's the best sleeping bag? What's the best stove? That sort of thing. Now, weirdly, I'm not actually going to ask any of those questions because although this is an outkit night and we're hosting it, I, I don't want this to turn into a time to promote gear to you. Um, so if anybody, any of, the part, any of the participants want to chime in there and recommend kit, go ahead and do that. But we'll, we won't um, go into some of that stuff because this isn't about us selling stuff. It's about us all getting together and sharing, sharing what we love. So the first question that I'm going to ask is from Andrew Spencer. And he says, um, how do you find, go about finding places to stop overnight? Do you kind of stick to campsites? Do you go for a sneaky bivvy? Do you ask permission? Kind of what, what do you do? Um, so uh, anybody want to have a crack at answering that one? Go on, Catherine. Don't forget to take yourself off mute. All tentatively put our hands up at the same time. So this is a tricky one really tricky one and it depends where you are so if you're in somewhere like Scotland where there's right to roam legislation then legally you can camp almost anywhere um, I think the most important thing to stress at the very start is um, leaving places exactly as good as you found them if not better um, I've forgotten the word now which is really embarrassing um, Leave no trace. That's the one. Leave no trace principles. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since I've been bikepacking, can you tell? <laughs> um, so the really important thing is to treat the land with respect. Um, and if you see some rubbish or something, even if it's not yours, just pick it up. It's not hard to do. Um, in terms of finding good spots, it kind of depends on what you have. So your requirements for if you have a hammock are going to be quite different to if you have a bivvy or a tent. Um, I tend when I'm planning a trip to look in advance using maps. So something like um, an ordnance survey map or an open street map or something like that. Um, as a hammocker, I tend to look for forests um, and I'll note a couple of different options in an area because you might turn up and it's been felled or it's unsuitable. Um, just have a little look. I think having some shelter is always really important. Um, and also, depending on the weather, if it's really cold, head into the forest because you, it's always a little bit warmer. Um, if there, it's likely to be misty or if you're near water bodies, always try and go up a little bit. Um, I had a really great camp near Lake Bala in Snowdonia a few years ago. And for some reason, it was getting really, really cold and we knew there was going to be mist by the water. And for some reason, I just knew that we had to get higher up. Um, and then in the morning, it was August, but it was two degrees. And as we descended into town to get a greasy fry up to start the day, uh, it was absolutely freezing. Um, so it's something that comes with the experience most of the time, but I definitely recommend looking on maps and things in advance. But I'm sure the other two have some good ideas too. Do you want to add anything, Emma or Steve? Yeah, so I'm I'm a bit different from Catherine. I'm more of a bivouacker, so I um, uh, I'm too normally too tired or lazy to put a tent up. So I go for the bivouac option, and I like to have some kind of roof so that dew and rain um, don't get me in. Because I live in Switzerland, and so this year, of course, it's it's all been bike <laughs> bikepacking at home. Um, there's lots of um, forest huts, and um, obviously, as Catherine said, um, 
leave no trace, but also obey the rules. So I try not to obviously decamp where it's not allowed. But the, another important thing to think about is water source. So um, water is really heavy to carry. And um, especially if you've already got a bottle of wine, uh, the water as well is a real pain. So it's worth trying to find somewhere with a water fountain or not too far from a village or a town where you could get water either in Switzerland, there's lots and lots of public of um, drinking water public fountains or um, public toilets, which sounds really weird, but um, they're a great place uh, to go to the loo and also brush your teeth before you go to bed and fill up your bottles again with clean water. And if you can, if you can camp somewhere not too far out of town, then um, you have all the peace and quiet, but you've also um, had a facility. Um, the other thing I'd say is that when I've been racing bikepacking, so um, with a spot tracker, um, the one thing that made me really nervous, even though it's not particularly logical, was the thought that someone could find me in the night when I'm asleep using the spot tracker because they can, everyone can see where you are. And that really creeped me out um, on my own. Um, otherwise, I, I'm normally fine camping on my own. But I really got scared at the thought that someone could find me who I don't know. Um, so then I actually camped basically uh, in villages, but super sort of um, sneaky. So I like not quite in someone's garden, that would be that would be bad. But um, like in a sort of I in the summer in the Hope Thousand, I basically bivied in a, a patch of grass um, between two hedgerows in the middle of a village, because then I figured um, all these imaginary people that might be following me, not that they exist, um, then you know that you're you're in a you're in a town, and people don't know really where you are. So if you're a bit nervous about that kind of thing, then it's worth going on the edge of, of a village or a town, um, but not in someone's garden, because they might get annoyed. That would be my advice. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Emma. The, the only other thing to add to that, I think, is um, is I if if camping, uh, you know, like if sleeping out and stuff is freaking you out, go and do that. Just like just go and have a bivy without your bike. So, you know, like Alistair Humphreys has done a load of stuff on micro adventures and that's brilliant for learning. And, you know, just just going out, walking up a hill and kind of picking a spot um is a really is, is a really great way of if kind of a you know keeping your eye getting your eye in for looking for spots but also you don't have all the stress and drama of like you're away somewhere from home and bike packing you know you can you can do that pretty close to your house so um you know if if, if sleeping out is a bit of an issue for you um yeah d d ditch the bike and and just go and just go and try and sleep out on a hill one night or you know find us find a spot and sleep there because the worst that happens if, if it doesn't work out, you can kind of pack up and walk home at four o'clock in the morning. You know, if it lashes down with rain or something um, common in the UK. So, uh, yeah. Cheers. Cheers. That's, that's a great tip, actually. Um, we're going to have to take, do, do one more question before we do the caption competition, because I'm concerned that some people might have a date to watch Christmas Chronicles or Elf or something. So um, quick question, then we'll do the caption competition, then a few more questions. Uh, question from Robin Goodwin, which is, uh, Steve, you'll probably go to, to petrol stations and get this stuff, but uh, any tips for packing food on multi-day trips? Because Robin doesn't seem to be able to find places to put all his croissants. Anybody want to answer that one? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll dive in there. I, I, I think it's, um, it, it's good to take some food with you. I mean, obviously this depends on your route. If your route is going out into the wilderness, and you're not going to see anything well then you're you're going to have to you're going to have to pack food but if you're you know i think most bike packing trails or most bike packers generally try and aim for kind of past cheeky pubs or kind of shops and things like that on route so um you know you can kind of fuel up as you go and obviously it depends on how long you're going out for as well if it's a big multi-day thing you you really want to um be pretty savvy in your in your in your route planning in terms of where you can drop in and out of, uh, of villages and towns or whatever that is, or are you going to kind of take all of that with you? And, you know, that's, that's something that uh, again, I think comes down to a lot of experience, but um, yeah, kind of whatever works, but I'd say if it's a real problem, start small with overnighters before you go out on a massive epic, <laughs> you don't want to get that too long yeah. on, a, on a three week journey. I'd agree. I think with Steve that I mean, if you're going to go proper self-sufficient, like um, like at GB Duro this year, like it's it's a lot unless you're you're really good at surviving on a few calories, which works for a couple of days, but then it's really miserable. Um, it's it's a lot to carry, and and you have to think about some serious luggage solutions on your bike to carry enough calories. Um, I, I one of the things that I have loved about bikepacking is just learning to eat anything. Not quite, but I mean, basically, if I get to a service station or or a pizzeria. 
I don't care what it is. And I used to be really fussy about food. I mean, I still am a bit fussy about food, but when I'm bikepacking and I'm hungry, I will eat anything. And, um, you know, beware the marmot that comes too close. But um, I, and I think that's really fun. It's actually kind of, it's almost like freeing, having been a, like an athlete who had to watch their diet, like, give me the pizza and, and the croissants. Like when I did the Hope this year, my aim was to eat five croissants a day. Um, and I almost managed it. And um, I still came back yeah you know there still wasn't enough calories basically and um you can survive on less than you need for a day or two but then it gets it gets miserable and um and so the other thing i would say is that yeah calorie density so if you if you are trying to pack as much food as possible think about like don't take bran flakes like there isn't much calorie in there for the amount of space and weight so take you know things that are fatty and sugary because they have a higher calorie density so I personally I love Snickers and I always have an emergency Snickers just in case um like I carried one for a thousand k in Hope Thousand and took it home and it is now my like my prize Snickers that is totally broken and battered but it's holy my holy thousand k Snickers so yeah calorie density and if you possibly can just stop and bite whatever can I add something I um I can't profess to be any good on this topic because I am the cheeky pub stopper. I think this is why me and my friends are never going to make it as ultra endurance races. But um, besides actual nutrition, I think what you eat on a bike packing trip can really affect your mood. And for me, stopping in a pub is like a morale boost, and you you probably get to dry off your gloves a bit, which are soaking wet or <laughs> warm your toes or go and have a little wash in the bathroom and stuff like there's And even just chat to the locals, they might tell you about a really good spot um, if they're really friendly or something. Or I've even had it when I've been in pubs in Wales where then somebody very kindly and not in a weird way, like invites you to go and sleep in their garden because they've got a little lean to, which is, uh, you know, good because it's going to rain that night. So um I need to learn myself about the real extreme multi-day food stuff, but don't be afraid to sort of cheat. It's not really cheating. It's not and cheating. Go to a pub. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> can I, can I know we're over time, but can I bust in with my best ever morale boost? Oh, sure. And I've had lots of morale boost from food because I love food. But I, when I was on the first day of this Hope 1000 last year um, in the summer, I was only in June. I, um, I was, the first day I blew up and I had the shakes after 200K and I kept going after a few Snickers and, I really wanted to get to a certain village where I knew there was a pizzeria and a hotel and it was going to rain and I didn't want to sleep out with just a big bag. I had no, I didn't have a big bag. I had just a sleeping bag. So I got to this village at quarter to midnight and the hotel pizzeria was closed. And so I was a bit bereft and I had no food ready and everything else was closed, but I found a pizza takeaway place. So I rocked up at five to closing time covered in cow shit. And I thought they would be a bit, dismissive and instead the lady there was the loveliest person she looked at me and she said what kind of pizza do you want and she met they made me a special pizza and they let me sit in the pizza even though I had clothes to eat it and um, then she said well, what, what are you even doing like biking covered in cow shit late at night and I tried to explain and she said well where are you gonna sleep and I said well just under a tree somewhere she said it's, it's gonna rain that's crazy and she looked at her husband who was making the pizzas and she said we could just let her sleep here so they let me sleep in the pizzeria on the sofa, like dream come true. Like, do you wake up to the smell of pizza? And it was just the loveliest thing. Like the kindness of strangers is one of the things, like I nearly cried and um, um, they wouldn't take any money. And they, you know, it was just the loveliest thing. And so, and it was an amazing pizza. And so, yeah, stopping for food is also, it gives you this chance to have this interaction with people, which can be just really delightful. And you meet like, the, you kind of, you're kind of vulnerable. Not, you're not really vulnerable, but you feel a bit, you kind of you're a different kind of person when you're out on your own bike packing and I think it makes a lot of people more friendly and, and generous and it um I've, I've been delighted by the help I've had when I've normally stopped for food and people laugh you know, at me you know what Emma I think for people who do have to leave us now that is a really really lovely story because for so many of us who go bike packing and have done that stuff the things you remember the interactions like that yeah and the amazing thing is actually is just how common People have got yeah. stories like that. I bet there's so many people yeah. on the exactly. webinar now saying, oh yeah, that had a similar thing happen to me. And that's the joy of a journey yeah. by bike, isn't it? That's the joy of bikepacking. And I think it's something about turning up looking so bedraggled and pathetic that like, how can someone not have pity? Um, <laughs> and I think if someone rocked up at my doorstep looking like I looked covered in cow shit on a rainy night, I'd, I'd let them sleep on the sofa and probably exactly. try and make them a pizza. It would be a terrible pizza, but yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I agree. I think that's one of the things is that you really, even though you, spend a, you can spend a lot of time alone bikepacking, but it's still, the interactions with people are absolutely delightful. Emma, I've got to stop this. There's, there's people who've got half past eight quizzes with friends and they're waiting for the caption competition result thinking have i won the hundred pound voucher so let's we'll, we'll we'll come back to this in a moment but in fairness to everyone we've just got to give the caption competition so if we look at the the picture again we'll come back um and and um and do this so it's been very very distracting uh having uh, the the caption competition results and remarks coming through so thank you for sending uh, those through it's it's a very, very friendly and creative bunch of people on the Outkit customer base. Uh, we love you all. It's, it's so good. So the, um, the ones I've picked out here are Laura Butler. Thanks, Laura, for this, who says, well, that's my chance of snapping the lesser spotted warbler ruined. We've also <laughs> got uh, Jim McEwen. And I do my favourite, uh, is it? Uh, it's do my favourite David Attenborough here. It's... Um, here we see a KOM hunter in their natural habitat. Um, we've also got um, Ali Hallsworth. Uh, he says, uh, maybe I should take the, put the stabilizers back on. Um, Rachel Dawson, I love this one. Um, when I said, imagine I'm not here. And then finally, uh, my favorite one, the, the winner goes to, um, are you ready for this? Graham Hilton, which was, Eric finally fulfilled his ambition to make it into the countryside country file calendar. So uh, yeah, very good. Thank you for that. So um, Graham Hilton, send us an email to together at alpkit.com uh, with your details and we will get in touch with you uh, with your hundred pound voucher. And then also uh, Laura, Rachel, Jim, Ali, also send us an email with your uh, with your details to uh, together at outkit.com and very specifically could you let me know your t-shirt size and we'll send you something wonderful in the post so thank you very much for that um, so uh, with that for people who need to go at half eight thank you thank you very much for coming I realize everyone's been on so many video calls and this is yet another one and it's, it's a real pleasure for you for us to for you to join us and I also really appreciate that um, Amazon and Netflix spend billions of pounds on programming and you could have watched anything on Amazon Netflix tonight but you've chosen to spend an hour with us which is really really amazing and we're kind of really really touched by that so thank you very much and also thank you to Emma thank you to Catherine and thank you to Steve we are so so genuinely kind of I can't tell you how pleased and grateful we are that you've you spent time with us. Um, and the, the, thing, the thing I'd say to everyone is do do follow um, what's, uh, what everyone's doing on social. So um, on Twitter, to do follow at, at Catherine Bikes. And for all those people who wanted to know what gear to take and um, about kit, go and have a look at adventure.cc. There's stacks and stacks of useful stuff on there. And uh, Catherine was saying, I know a few people have been asking about this. Unpaved podcast is having a bit of a hiatus at the moment. It will, be, it will be back. Have a look for it. Listen to it. It's really, really good. It's full of those stories that kind of Emma's just alluding to. That's really, really good. Um, Steve, you should follow Steve Bate, MBE, on, uh, on Instagram. Ace, ace photos, great tales. And also, you'll soon be able to follow Steve's trip from um, Cairo to Cape Town, which will be supreme. And for bikepacking inspiration, uh, Pooley Emma uh, on Instagram. The photos on that Instagram feed. Is, if you ever want inspiration today, shall I go bikepacking? They're they're absolutely wonderful. So so do do follow. follow. Be warned, you might get hooked on running too because I'm. You might get hooked on running. Quite a few running photos. Yeah, just, just yeah. let me go for, for running as well. So thank you. If you do need to go, thank you very very much indeed. Um, should we uh, stick around and, and get a few more questions? Should, should we do that? Yeah. Okay. So so another question that that. Um, came through was uh, Michael McClelland. Any tips for wet bikepacking trips? Apart from don't go. Mm, it's a, it is a different fish, that different kettle of fish. I My one tip that um, a friend here advised me to try, and I was very skeptical, but she was totally right, was the waterproof shorts, over shorts. So, um, I still bike pack in Lycra because uh, I love, I've got really lovely, lovely cycling shorts and um, yeah, so I'm not very cool. But um, when it's raining, I wear 
um, actually, they were actually, I made them myself. They're waterproof trousers that I've cut down into shorts. And it keeps, it's not going to keep you totally dry, but they keep your bum dry, which is a big deal. And they keep them, some of the mud out of your bum, which is also nice, especially if you're doing a multi-day trip. Um, and uh, a campfire is a great way to dry out your kit. Uh, but be careful not to melt your shoes because I've done that and it was suboptimal. I melted little drips of plastic down the heels of my shoes, but I didn't like them anyway, so it was okay. Uh, the, the only thing I can add to that is if you know you're going out in the wet, um, again, start small, start on an overnighter. Um, so, you know, anyone can get wet, piss wet through overnight, doesn't matter. Um, you know, you can still make it home the following day uh, and learn the lessons from that. You know, bivvying is really challenging in the wet if you're just in a bag and don't have a tarp or anything like that. Um, but the more trips you do, you'll be able to extend them and you'll work out, you know, what's um, the best way to dry stuff, stuff and stuff in a dry bag and your sleeping bag. And, you know, that kind of, even if it doesn't dry it overnight, at least it kind of, you're pulling on warm wet kit in the morning, which is kind of nicer than cold wet kit in the morning. So yeah, I'd, I'd say start small, you know, go out in the rain on an overnighter and, and just kind of try things and then work, work out what works for you really. The only, thing, oh, the only thing that I would add is I quite like to spend maybe every third night in a youth hostel or a hostel like a, a b and or hotel, not anything posh, but just so that I can wash myself, <laughs> wash and wash all of my kit um, because that's just a really great morale boost. And also I don't really want to be riding along in stinky kit the whole time. I don't think you have to write something like that off. Um, it doesn't make you any less of a bike packer or whatever. It's just um, quite nice to not all be. And uh, yeah, then you, if it's been raining, it's actually quite nice to get a decent night's sleep in a dry bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's totally fine. Thanks, guys. We'll, we'll do two more questions live. And then what we'll do after this is stick around on the chat if you, if you want to, and we'll, we'll answer questions on the chat. But we'll do two more questions live. Um, one of them, actually, we've had a, a few people ask this, and, it, and it's, a, it's a thorny question. But Matt Cox asks the, uh, the question, which is, is there really a difference between bikepacking and cycle touring? Um, I think there is in the perception of it, but I would argue no. It's traveling by bike, self, like with your own luggage. And I, uh, yeah, uh, personally, I, I think some of the labels are a little bit, they're designed for marketing and they're designed for coolness. And, um, but I do not aspire to be cool. So I'm happy to say I'm a cycle tourer or a bike packer. I don't really care. I think, I think generally it seems to, bike packing seems to be more of the off-road stuff, but um yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on the nomenclature of cycling disciplines, but Catherine will for sure know the actual answer. So I don't know why I even said anything. Catherine, sorry. No, no, you're spot on. I think bikepacking seen more as an off-road thing, but like they're just names. What does it really matter as long and as also, it's fun? You can take a road bike off-road, I've discovered. I mean, with <laughs> moderate success <laughs> or not. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have and a final question. And this is, um, Christy Lynch has asked this. And actually, the, the question is, and we'll finish on this one, uh, top three tips for young enthusiasts. But actually, considering we've got so many people who are new to bikepacking here, um, let's see if we can get the top three tips for new people who are new to bikepacking. Uh, who wants to go first? Yeah, why not? I'll... Oh, go on, Steve. Go big, go far, go light, go fast. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, again, like I've said it, I've said it, you know, a couple of times tonight. Is just, just really start small and make it fun. Like, you know, this is, you know, bike packing is such a massive open thing, and it's what you want it to be. You know, whether or not that's riding with panniers or that's riding with a saddlebag, whatever that is. But you know, I mean, the the more people we can get to do it, the 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 more the sport grows, and and you know, and it's and it's better for everyone. So. I think just, you know, just start small and, and just have fun with it. You know, that's, that's all it is. Catherine, what do you think? What's your tip? Uh, that's a really good one. It's hard to beat that. Take friends. Fair enough. Maybe not everyone enjoys the company of others, but I always have so much more fun uh, when I'm with some pals. And if something goes really wrong, then you can all laugh about it and you're not just laughing on your own <laughs> because yeah. stuff does go wrong inevitably you'll get stories from every trip uh, and that's totally fine you just learn it helps you learn thanks catherine yeah. emma 
You get the final well, word on this. As Stephen Catherine would like made the best point, so I'm going to make some stupid points. And um, my first one is, uh, uh, I'm not a fan of chamois cream, but it is worth taking something that is a, uh, let's just say, a, um, something against friction. Because if you start getting chafing, it will ruin your bike packing trip. And that's the same for a long road ride. Um, yeah, Catherine's laughing her head off. It's very serious. <laughs> just okay. don't want to say the so, word lubricant. <laughs> I don't want to say the word lubricant, but that's what I meant. Take lubricant, guys. And we all say lubricant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so now I have actually a, spe a specific recommendation and I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but this stuff is great. And it's not a chamois cream. It's this stuff called Lanocaine. You can get it in any chemist in the UK, pretty much. And... Um, it's uh, it's a gel and it is awesome for stopping chafing. It also has a local analgesic. And if you've got chafing, and it also it works for feet as well. Like if you've got rubbing on your feet, um, is is awesome stuff. It's just a little tube, and it's so good. And you can't buy it in Switzerland. So this is quite a funny story. The last time I was home for Christmas, so the last time I saw my parents was last Christmas because of COVID. And I was and I went to the boots near my dad's house, and I ordered in ten tubes of lanocaine. And the lady looked at me like. Why do you need so much lubricant? I was like, all my friends also want some. So I was bringing back some for my friends. I was like, honestly, it's for my friends. I, I'm not using all the lubricant myself. So my top tip is take lubricant <laughs> and yeah, take the extra calories. Like, like, um, like we said before, take lots of extra calories in the form of chocolate. Thank you so much. Emma, thank you. So just um, <laughs> on that, we'll, we will stick around. <laughs> I can't believe we finished on take lubricants. Lube and, and chocolate. chocolate. So <laughs> you can rely yeah. on me to lower the tone. <laughs> yeah. At least you didn't say lube. That would have been horrible. No, no, no. That's for chains. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll finish there. What we'll do is we'll stick around on the chat. So if you, if you want to keep chatting with us, we'll stick around for, for 15 minutes. As I say, thank you so much, everyone, for sticking with us. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, thank you to everyone who's signed on. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have another one of these. Uh, do join us. They're a great, great fun for us and it's lovely to have you with us. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll all go on mute now. We'll turn our videos off.